Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good really early morning if you're <laughs> joining in from the Middle Eastern area or the African continent, because I could see some registrations from there as well. And of course, good afternoon turning towards evening in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, we're super thrilled to bring you this. Uh, this is our keynote session and we'll get started uh, pretty quickly. Uh, this is the Empowering the Truth Global Summit brought to you by ICFJ, which is the International Center for Journalists. Uh, you would have come through ICFJ, so you know all of this anyway. And uh, this is a series of workshops really on the theme of disarming disinformation. Uh, and it's also like we think of it also on how to make the truth go viral. In fact, that is the title of the keynote session today. Um, I'm HR Venkatesh, by the way, from Boom Live, and we are fact checkers in India, Bangladesh, and Myanmar. And we're bringing this to you, as I said, in association with ICFJ. And we have an absolute legend today speaking, and I'm going to hand over to Dr. Masato Kajimoto. He's an associate professor at the University of Hong Kong. Um, and he's, he's someone we all know very well in Southeast Asia and South Asia and across the world as well. Uh, uh, he's 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 been teaching media literacy, and he brings in a very sort of analytical, but at the same time very empathetic approach to the practice of understanding what disinformation is and how to um, go beyond understanding and communicate to people how to deal with disinformation. So I'm really thrilled for what he's going to be saying. I'm quickly actually going to share my screen and tell you what's coming up in the next. Uh, today and in the next um, in the next few sessions. So this, of course, is today. How might we make the truth go viral? Uh, thoughts and considerations from Dr. Masato Kajimoto, um, and this is, as I said, brought to you by ICFJ along with Boom via all these supporting organizations. But we also have uh, it's it's a series of one keynote and five workshops. So we have Shohini Guharoy, who is the group head of uh, audience and growth at Network 18. Uh, she's come via the Quint and NDTV. Uh, and she's going to be talking about how to use social platforms. And she's someone who's worked with social platforms from 2014 onward. So she will be also able to tell us how things have changed over the last almost what 10 years uh, since we've had these social platforms, especially from a news perspective, that is on uh, the 2nd of March, and that's uh, Indian Standard Time, 11, 11 a.m., so that's, uh, uh, that's what, one thirty in Singapore time. We also have, uh, not just Shohini, as I said, every Thursday of March, we have a different workshop, so we have mobile video for truth-telling, so um, especially now when it comes to uh, the growth of vertical video, we thought this is very interesting. Uh, so we have two fantastic instructors in Manon Warshaw and Sanshay Biswas. They both um, travel around the world teaching people how to use video and mobile video. And I'm sure that'll be a fantastic session. That's again on a Thursday, same time. And then we have uh, perhaps the best podcaster in India, uh, in terms of attracting people and also in terms of quality, Amit Verma, he's going to talk about podcasts, how they're better at conveying the truth and how to get started. Uh, and we are going to round off with, of course, two more legends, which is Rishad Patel of Splice Media. He's going to talk about design basics for journalists who want to spread facts. That's on the 23rd of March. That's again another Thursday. And finally, we're going to have strategic communication uh, from Alan Soon of Splice Media, getting your overall strategy right before settling on tactics. So it's an entire toolkit, shall, shall we say, on how to deal with um, disinformation and how to spread facts and spread the, spread the truth, which we are all in the in the business of being in. And so that is what's coming up. And just one quick note: uh, this a series also comes with a grant and mentorship for select participants. Uh, we'll tell you how that process is going to work over the next few weeks. Uh, but one minimum requirement is you have to attend at least three webinars to qualify. And as I understand it, it is at least three webinars from anywhere in the world. So this is 
a simultaneous program that's happening in South Asia and Southeast Asia, but in other parts of the world as well from ICFJ. So you have to at least attend three, three webinars to qualify for this grant and membership. And we'll tell you exactly how this is going to happen. Uh, watch out for the announcement from ICFJ in the coming weeks. With that, I'm going to hand it over back, uh, or I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Masato Kajimoto. Masato, it's all yours. The floor. And as he's unmuting himself and showing his camera, I'm also going to say that if you have any questions, uh, please use the Q&A box uh, and we'll try and take as many questions as possible. Hello, hello. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you. We cannot we okay. can see All you. Right. We, can Thank see you. you. we don't see you though. All right, hold on. Um... Hello, good morning, everyone. Um... Thank you so much for inviting me. My name is Masaru Kajimoto. I'm an associate professor um, at the um, University of Hong Kong Journalism and Media Studies Center. And um, if you guys don't mind, I should I keep the video on? I think it's kind of hard to look at the screen and be conscious about how I look and at the same time talk. Switch, so switch why don't I do this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you do that. And then when the Q&A comes, we can turn on the video yes, again. Yes, Perhaps. okay, yes. all right. So if you don't mind, I'm gonna focus on my slide and I will turn off the video. All right, so uh, I wanna start. Uh, when Vankatesh asked me this question, if I can talk about how we could possibly make the truth go viral, my first reaction is, well, I can talk about it, but probably I can't really give you a satisfying answer because if, anybody knows the answer to this question, then probably we won't be having this uh, conversation in the first place. It's a really, really big and serious problem that we have been dealing with for many, 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 many uh, years. When I say many, 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 many years, we are talking about hundreds of years. So this is what Jonathan Swift said more than 300 years ago. Falsehood flies and the truth comes limping after it. And I think this is the really indicative of the problem that we are facing today. If you think about it, Jonathan Swift is mostly known for his novel, Gulliver's Trouble, which is a fiction. He wrote it as a political satire at the time, but people took it as a fictional novel, and that's what he is well known for. Compared with other essays and writings that he wrote to analyze the politics, he realized probably that the fiction is the way to go. I'm not quite sure if that's what he thought, but the, that doesn't change the fact that he's most well known for fictional uh, novel, even though he has been writing quite a bit about, you know, a politics at the time in a non-fictional matter, in a journalistic manner, so to speak. Well, 100 years ago, um, there's this quote you see quite often when you attend this kind of conference about misinformation and disinformation. A lie travels around the world before the truth gets its boots on. Some say this was said by Mark Twain. Others say it's, no, it's actually from Winston Churchill. The truth is we don't know. Some fact checkers actually looked into the origin of this quote, but as far as I know, it's still undecided. We don't know. We are not sure who actually said this first. Now, if we are dealing with a problem that the whole society around the world could not solve for more than 300 years, I think it's really hard to solve it now, especially with the new technology, internet and social media. I think we are talking about a game that we cannot really win. In other words, lies will always get distributed much faster and wider than the truth. Even if truth goes viral, relatively speaking, probably lies have much wider and faster reach than the truth. So, and I'm telling you this because I have been I don't know about you, but I quite like new technology. And I've been playing with ChatGPT for the last few weeks quite extensively. And it's so easy to generate believable 
made up nonsense and bogus news stories with this technology. I can easily churn out 20 bogus news articles with real people with malicious intention in, I don't know, one hour, 10 minutes, and then put it on various social media platform websites. So I think if we, are, as a journalist, we, if we try to play the same game as the bad actors are playing, I don't think we can win. I don't think that's the strategy we should adopt. Now, I would like to also argue that if we are defining the word vi going viral or virality as the reach, then a lot of you who are working for the mainstream news media, you already actually have the reach. Uh, here, my slide is kind of, um, has lots of text in it. But if you think about it, the mainstream media, um, for example, um, evening news programs on national TV in many Asian countries, they are watched in tens of millions of households every night. And even a very viral YouTube video has what? One million views, two million views, three million views per episode. Whereas for TV news programs, you are reaching tens of millions of households and each household hopefully have more than one audience inside. So in terms of reach, actually, you don't need to worry too much about going viral. Yes, a newspaper sub subscription is going down in across Asia, but having said that, your reach is much higher than some you know, bogus misinformation news website, which sometimes go viral, sometimes they don't. So today, in today's presentation, I'd like to focus on what we can do to play our own game. So I said, yeah, it's time to step up the game, our game. So instead of joining their playing field, when I say they, well, I'm talking about the bad actors who are creating misinformation and disinformation. We say, why don't we step up our game? The, you know, old fashioned traditional news storytelling. How can we change that? Because we are in this mess and we are being confused um, by the audience. Oh, okay. Well, move on. So to illustrate my point, I think public health information is a good example because it's fresh in our memory. We all have still vivid memory of what happened during 2022 and 2022 during the COVID-19 pandemic. I mean, it's still ongoing, but there are lots of lessons we can learn from what happened in the last two, three years. Now, if you think about the public health information, there are a lot of steps that information goes through. First, there is the raw data, lots of patients, um, vaccine trials. It's a massive amount of data out there. And those data are often collected by somebody who can analyze the data. So if you, I don't know if you can see my castle on the screen actually. Uh, let me try. Well, I don't see it myself. Okay, never mind. So from raw slide. data to analyze data. Because data is massive, we are now in the living of big data, um, age of big data. So when you when somebody analyzes the data, they pick and choose what sort of data they analyze, right? So there's already a selection process. When they, after they analyze data, they can't possibly give all the analysis they have made to the audience. They have to, again, process the data and think about the output. So I'm writing research paper on this topic. I'm having press conference on this finding. So they will be selective about what sort of data they're gonna be talking about in the output. And from the output, you see other text generated news stories, or maybe infographics, maybe the news videos, whatever it is. So once analyzed data is being um, transformed into some sort of output, journalists are actually looking at that output and then creating a story. And then that story then goes to the audience. So this is probably the steps that information travels through. 
in fact checking, and I'm a big fan of uh, fact checking. And today's focus is why journalists need to learn number one, media literacy, and number two, fact checking techniques. So, why am I telling you this? Is because if you look at this from the audience point of view, if you if audience is confused and he wants to make sure, the first stop should be the journalists, right? The news stories that they just received, they think, okay, is this really true? I need more explanation. They go back one step and say, okay, is there any other news stories that are available for me to consume? Therefore, I could get clarification. That doesn't exist often. I mean, I'm telling you this because I teach fact-checking at my university. And when I train my students, I, we don't stop at the secondary source, secondary source being journalistic content. We say, no, go up the ladder, go to the research papers, go to the videos of the press conference, actually hear from the researchers themselves who wrote the paper, who talked in the press conference. If that is not enough information, then you go back to the actual data. What those sort of data that do researchers actually use? How did they select those data? Is there any data that they actually intentionally sort of ignored? So in other words, we might have to go back to the raw data to do fact checking. And this is really time consuming. And this is not, this should not be the way that um, audience has to fact check. Yeah. Again, but in the school, yes. I'm so sorry to interrupt Masato. Uh, yeah. Uh, is is this slides? Uh, is this the same slide? Because the slides um, we are on the raw data slide. Yeah, I. Think yeah, so, so I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Okay, okay, okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> right. A few examples. Um, this happened in Hong Kong in early 2020, February 6th, to be exact. This is a tweet from a news organization. I blurred which news organization it is. Um, this is about the panic buying of toilet papers. It happened really early in Hong Kong because the pandemic started in Wuhan. And there was a rumor in Hong Kong saying that all toilet paper factories in southern part of China are closing down. Therefore, we're going to run out very quickly that triggered panic buying. Now, when that rumor started spreading on social media, it, Hong Kong government was really quick and supermarket chain was also really quick. Uh, after a few hours, they came out and said, well, don't worry, people in Hong Kong, we have enough stock to last for the next six months. If you keep buying and consuming toilet papers as usual, then we have enough supply for the next six months. So don't panic buy. But that didn't work at all. That public uh, announce, I mean, service announcement didn't reach anywhere because journalists were reporting the complete opposite thing. They went to supermarket, they went to convenience stores, interviewing people who are lining up for two hours to buy toilet papers. This is a classic case of self-fulfilling prophecy. Media is hyping the situation unnecessarily so that people rationally thinking that, oh, we're going to run out of toilet paper. So they, you know, went out and buy more. So in a way, news reports were creating this uh, panic buying and helping people to, you know, misunderstand the situation. And this is one tweet from a journalist from Japan because this happened after what we have seen in Hong Kong. We observed the same thing happened in Australia and then Singapore and then Japan. When it happened in Japan, I saw this tweet from one of the journalists that I follow. And she's basically saying, let's think twice before tweeting any photo of empty shelves because that's not helping the public at all. In fact, it's making situation worse. Now. During, especially the early stage of pandemics, we've seen this kind of uh, sensational news coverage, which wasn't actually helping the situation at all, or, or much worse, actually. It's actually creating um, the panic unnecessarily. So there are many resources. I mean, I'm not, I'm not the only person who was saying this. There are many journalism experts 
um, academics, researchers, and practicing journalists who are also cautioning about this kind of news coverage. And so these are some of the resources that was made available at the time. And this kept happening again and again and again. This one was a map about supposedly a map showing how people from Wuhan traveled around the world before the city was locked down because it was the Chinese New Year holiday. Um, and we looked into this and the bad thing is we got suspicious. Does this map really show what it claims to show? When you do a sim simple thing like reverse image search, you came up with lots of other news media already using this map before verifying it. So by the time we fact check it, it was too late. It was already everywhere. So many news organizations were already using the map, claiming that this is how Chinese people traveled uh, with COVID-19 virus. I mean, at the time, virus was not named. But so this is the situation we are in. In other words, if media is helping to spread misinformation, again, we can't really uh, win this fight. We got to do something differently. Another example was the vaccine efficacy rate. So this one, one article from the, on the left is from the pointer. On the right is from live science website. Basically, two articles are also cautioning journalists not to spread misinformation about vaccine very, uh, efficacy. When vaccine was becoming available, there was a lot of talk about which one is better. Or oh, AstraZeneca is 85% efficacy rate. Um, Pfizer is 90%. Sinovac is 65%, blah, blah, blah. So many journalists reported as if to say, if the vaccine efficacy rate is 95%, that means five out of 100, even if you're get, getting, getting vaccinated, you get COVID. So, <laughs> and at the times, uh, efficacy rate for Sinovac was like 65%. And many people say, oh, Sinovac is useless because you know 45% of the people who got vaccinated still get virus and get sick. And it was not true at all, but that, is what many journalists thought what vaccine efficacy rate means. And this is what I mean by uh, we have to go back to the original data, and which I did with my students. And we took the data from the phase three trial of AstraZeneca in the UK, and we realized that there are 43,000 participants. And if just by looking at what the data shows, about 21,000 people who got vaccinated eight got positive. So even if you're vaccinated, you get virus, we know that. And at the time during the phase three trial, 0.03% uh, of the vaccinated group got COVID. And the control group, not the treated group, in the control group, 21,000 people, again, 162 positive cases. So that's 0.7%. So even if you don't get vaccinated at the time, we know that Omicron changed everything. But before that, the chances of you getting infected and testing positive was 0.7%, not like 5% out of 95, even if you're vaccinated. If you're vaccinated, actually chances are at the time, 0.03%. So this is a very, very different figure we can talking about. So from here, we can actually calculate the risk ratio and then come up with efficacy rate, right? So the mathematic is, mathematics is very simple. I can do this with my son at the time, and he was like 10 or 9. This is like 10-year-old grade mathematics in Hong Kong because it's a basic division nothing else. So mathematics is simple. It's just a matter of understanding what the data shows and what efficacy rate means. But in journalism, we can't just show this formula. We have to tell a story. So when you translate this number into the text, that's where difficulty is. And I think that's the reason why um, this workshop exists, right? You're going to be learning about podcasting and video producing, because when you tell the story, how do you make it easy to understand so that people actually get the facts straight away? And that's the difficult part. Now, journalists often assume 
that people actually read their article. And this is a typical example from Reuters. If you look at the headline, Peru volunteer in Sinopharm vaccine trial dies of COVID-19 pneumonia, university says. Now, if you just read the headline, it looks like this university in Peru was testing Sinopharm vaccine and this volunteer got COVID and died. And that's exactly what the headline says. It's when you read the third paragraph, you realize that this person who died was actually in the control, not the treated group. In other words, this person did not get the vaccine. This person was given placebo. So her getting COVID-19 and dying had almost nothing to do with the vaccine. But you don't get that impression from the headline. What I'm trying to say here is that oftentimes health experts and journalists often you know, dismiss nonsense information or ignore it. And this is the trend, uh, tendency I see among the participants when I do training with professional journalists as well. I mean, younger ones are relatively uh, familiar with the kind of people's reactions on social media and whatnot. So they know that people believe some nonsense, but many seasoned journalists in my training, the first hurdle they need to overcome is this. They are trained journalists. They can immediately spot like, you know, nonsense conspiracy theories and they dismiss it right away without realizing how many people actually believing and sharing it. So we might need to change our mindset. And to do so, I think media literacy training really helps to understand how news reporting are being understood or misunderstood or used or misused by the audience. Because in media literacy training, we actually looked at news from the audience point of view. And that viewpoint is often missing when I talk to professional journalists. So that's something that I'm gonna be uh, talking a little bit more about today. And also basic mathematics training and especially statistics like, you know, science news and also opinion polls. We see lots of mistakes made by journalists on daily basis when it comes to basic mathematics and statistics and science. So that's something that I think, again, we should step up our game. I think now this is one of the um, messages that I give in my media literacy training. And I think this is also applicable to many journalists as well. Instead of reporting right away, you can pause a little bit and reflect on what information you are trying to communicate with the audience. And before you tell right away, you should investigate a little bit. And after that, you share what you know, and more importantly, what you don't know. And this is the part I think it's the key, especially in in a situation like COVID-19 news reporting, there are so many known unknowns. And I think it's important for journalists to tell the audience what is unknown as well. But that part is often missing in news reporting. Yes, journalists are good at telling what they have already discovered and gathered during the process, but they don't often talk enough about what they don't know, what researchers don't know yet. Because, you know, oh, researchers still don't know ABC isn't an attractive headline, but we might want to change the mindset. And then we, of course, need to keep monitoring the situation. And this problem existed for a long time. I've been in, I started teaching news literacy in 2011, and we have been collecting lots of um, examples that we can incorporate in our teaching. And this is an example from many years ago, 2015, actually. This is when WHO announced that uh, 50 grams of processed meat will increase your chances of developing um, colon cancer by 18%. When WHO announced this, there was big news coverage everywhere around the world because processed meat was categorized in the same group as smoking cigarettes. So if you look at the headlines, you can kind of tell. Processed meats rank alongside smoking as cancer causes, WHO says, that's the Guardian. So when this happened, we got skeptical, right? And suspicious, really? 
three slices bacon is as bad as smoking cigarette. So we looked into it and we also looked at different news coverage, which one explains this better than the other ones. And we created sort of like media literacy uh, video and I'm going to show you uh, the bit of that instructional video that we created. This is less than two minutes. So let's see if I can play back and let me know if the audio doesn't play back. I think it should work. So surprisingly, many news outlets resorted to he said, she said journalism. WHO says this, other experts disagree. Therefore, things are not clear. It may be factual, but such reports do not help or inform the news audience. An article from the Huffington Post, on the other hand, mentioned that an average lifetime risk of developing colorectal cancer in the United States is 4.5%, according to the country's National Cancer Institute. Now, if we take this as the base risk and suppose that eating 50 grams of processed meat, an equivalent of three slices of cooked bacon every day, could increase the risk from there by 18%, it means the risk goes up from 4.5% to 5.3%. The increased risk is about one percentage point. The article also told us that the likelihood of developing lung cancer for non-smokers is 7%. And for those who smoke a pack of cigarettes every day, the risk is 23 times higher than that. In other words, the article put the numbers into context and explained that eating processed meats does not pose the same health risks as cigarette smoking does. All right, I, I think you get the idea. Uh, yes, the risk itself increases by 18%, but the base risk is so much lower than smoking cigarettes. So that's the number one uh, fact that was often, often ignored by the media coverage. And number two, if you think about the risk of smoking, in re relation to non-smokers, it's not even the same league. Processed meat is so much safer than smoking cigarettes in, in this case. But only one Huffington Post um, article written by, I, uh, I don't quite remember, it was a journalist or a researcher, but that was the only one that mentioned the base risk among many, many news coverages I read. Even the explainer did mention the base risk. So that was a bit disheartening to me. And this keeps happening. And this is last month. Um, Independence says rotation of Arthur's inner core may have slowed. CNN says Arthur's inner core may have stopped turning and could go into reverse. And here's a BBC headline Arthur's inner core may have started to spin in the opposite direction. So again, if the mainstream news media does this, I don't think it's helping the situation at all because, and then another fact-checking organization in UK, full fact, looked at this and then concluded that's complete bogus. <laughs> that's not what research paper says at all. Now, as a journalist, you have to understand that research paper is written for other researchers, experts in the field. So their language is not the language that we normally use and understand. So if you just look at the abstract of the paper, you might get the impression that us is actually stop rotating the core, but that was not what the researcher actually meant, right? And another example, this just came out a few days ago uh, from the EU Disinfo Lab, and it's a really good booklet. I have only read half of it, but it's really good. They are looking into how intentionally manipulative content, disinformation gets into the mainstream news media in India. So they discovered that there is um, this strategy adopted by bad actors to create bogus quotes, uh, very questionable uh, content, basically bad sources. They plant those things into different areas and that gets picked up by mainstream news media and from there, it spreads all over the country in India in this case. So again, I think my message, I'm repeating myself here, is that there is something that is not working in the 
in journalism, and we have to uh, think about that and change that. To, uh, um, okay, I think I'm gonna go another five minutes or so, and then we can move on to Q and A. Now, when I talk about journalism today, this is the video I start my class with the students. And this video, again, is less than two minutes. I think it's one minute and a half. And it's created by uh, France 24, that's the 24 hour news channel in France, uh, many years ago. But I still use it because this is a great um, discussion prompt if you're an educator. And if you're a journalist, this will make you think about the situation we are in for, for more than a decade now, actually. Okay, anyway, let me play back the video. So in my class, after watching the video, we have lots of discussions and what you learn from the video and what sort of things that are, um, France 24 is trying to imply, blah, blah, blah. But I think the core message that at least I want my students to get from this kind of discussions after watching the video is this, right? Journalists are no longer working for the public. If you look at all those small blue bars that represent like tweets and Twitter users, we realize that they are the ones who break the news. They are the ones who witness the news events. So rather, journalists are not working for the journal, uh, for the public, but we are working with the public. And I think this fundamental mind um, set, mindset shift is very important because people learn about the news first from their mobile phones. No matter how good you are, normally they get news from somewhere else first. So instead of telling what the public doesn't know, which is was the normal role of journalism and gate keeping the information, information's already out there. People are exposed to lots of content already. So our job is probably now is to help make sense of the information they already have rather than telling something that they don't know. So this is slightly different from investigative journalism. In investigative journalism, we are still talking about um, old-fashioned uh, digging uh, something that public needs to know but do not know. In day-to-day -day news reporting, it's the opposite now. People are already exposed to so much news content. Our job comes after that already happened. So fact-checking is an ex post facto verification process, and I think this should be the main job of news media now rather than reporting what's going on. 
what's going on can be reported by, it's important, but more importantly, I think verifying everything that is consumed by the audience is the key um, for the truth to go viral. If you think about the information ecosystem, yes, researchers and journalists often talk about disinformation and misinformation and misleading cherry-picked facts, biases. But if you think about the amount of information people consume a day, probably raw information is the biggest circle, right? Raw meaning people don't know if it's true or false or satire or basically no idea, just the information. Yes, some of them are misleading, the facts, but problematic, very biased opinions about facts, maybe. And then other smaller portion is misinformation, inaccurate information. This information, intentionally manipulative content, does even smaller. And the bigger problem, obviously, is that people don't differentiate them, right? We consume and share everything as if they are all equal. And if that's the case, to make the truth go viral, the journalist's job is to untangle or unweave the tangled web of like information mess. Um, some people call it information disorder. It's a disorder that we are experiencing every day. So how do we then untangle it is the question I think we should be asking. And this is the last video. And this one is also old, but I still use it in my teaching. And this is probably one way to untangle the web and make thing, the truth go viral because this video went really, really viral in 2016. And it actually comes from the weather channel in the US. I don't know, some of you might have seen this, but it's cropped, so it's only uh, less than two minutes. And I think this is the kind of practice that we should all adopt. Although culturally, this kind of aggressive uh, fact-checking isn't probably accepted in like my country, like Japan, for example, this is like um, too much, but I can see in some countries, in South, in some South Asian countries, this is culturally very acceptable and even preferable way to talk about uh, issues. So let's have a look. So last week, Breitbart.com published an article claiming that global warming was nothing but a scare and global temperatures were actually falling. Problem is, they used a completely unrelated video about La Nina with my face in it to attempt to back their point. Now, what's worse is that the U.S. Committee on Space Science and Technology actually tweeted it out. Here's the thing. Science doesn't care about your opinion. Cherry picking and twisting the facts will not change the future nor the fact note fact, not opinion, that the Earth is warming. So let's break it down. Their first claim is that global land temperatures have plummeted by one degree Celsius since the middle of this year, the biggest and steepest fall on record. Now, that was based on one satellite estimate of global land temperatures, not a consensus. And second of all, land temperatures aren't an appropriate measure. The Earth is 70% water, and water is where we store most of our heat energy. So when you look at sea surface temperatures and you combine that with land temperatures, you actually get a record high for November of 2016. Their second claim, it can be argued that without El Nino, 2014 to 2016 would not have been record warm years. Now, you're taking a look at the Arctic sea ice melting here in this video from NASA. When you actually normalize the data, AKA take out the El Nino spike in temperatures, 2015 and 2016 still come in as the warmest years on record. So that brings me to claim number three. Many think that 2017 will be cooler than previous years. Now it is typical, yes, for temperatures to drop in a post El Nino environment, but certainly not to record lows. If that claim was correct, we would have had global record lows all over the last century. We, wouldn't, we haven't seen that since 1911. The last time we fell below the 20th century average was in 1976. And guess what? That was directly following the 1974 1975 strong El Nino. So next time you're thinking about publishing a cherry picked article, try consulting a scientist first. And to all my fellow scientists out there, let's make the facts louder than the opinions. All right, so that was, uh, that was just one example of you know, fact-checking video going really, really viral and talked about by many people. And I still use it as uh, in my teaching. Um, and I will stop here. Uh, 
I work for Hong Kong Journalism Program, and I also run a media literacy or news literacy education NGO called Ani. And if you want to contact me, my email address is on the screen. All right, I stop here, Next. I think. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Masato. This was fantastic. And uh, <laughs> thank you for saying yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And and I, I just yeah. want to before we get into Q and A, I want to I just want to ask you to clarify something. Uh, you know, I've I've heard uh, you speak many times, um, and I've always come away with something valuable each time. And this time, what it is is you're essentially saying to everyone. Correct me if I'm wrong that there's no point in being a journalist. Okay, this is a very bad paraphrasing. There's no point in being a journalist today unless you're a fact checker. As in, <laughs> you're saying, let, let's leave the journalism to the public because uh -huh. they are going to report what is going on in their lives mm -hmm. far more accurately uh, than any media organization can. So now what should we do? In that case, um we we've got to we've got to all become verifiers is, is that what well, you're saying i think yes yes i that's what i am saying here but also it's not just me if you look at the you know widely used journalism textbooks in the us for example elements of journalism that one was first published in 2010 or well, we used 2017 edition, uh, no, 2007, sorry, 2007 edition. Mm -hmm, yeah. Even then, the book says, well, journalist's role now is verification. We are in the job of verifying the information. So I think that more than ever is important for, I'd say, you know, being a journalist, you know, you have to learn the basic skills, right? How to write, how to take photos if you're a photographer, how to shoot videos if you're a videographer. I think fact-checking has to be part of that skill every journalist must have. So I think that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. So we, I, I, uh, let's do a quick time check. We have about 12 minutes, I believe. So there we have 12 questions. So we'll quickly run through them. Um, uh, okay. In no... In no uh, order of merit, I'm, I'm going with Karen Rebello's uh, question. Question okay. for Dr. Masato, in case of the COVID pandemic, if you have many instances of doctors who are themselves peddling misinformation and yeah. adding to the confusion, so what yeah. are the steps fact checkers can do in such a situation? Uh, well, I mean, I can't answer that in one minute. <laughs> <laughs> Many fact no. fellow fact checkers, yeah, in the audience also face the same issue. I think, I mean, in our case, we actually try to talk to as many you know uh, experts as possible, and we also talk uh, ask experts about the reputation of that particular doctor in question or expert in question. And we, I said, you know, we tell we should tell what we know and what we don't know. So there are two cases that happened recently. One was uh, opinion piece from Wall Street Journal. The other one is, uh, again, opinion piece in New York Times. Both times, columnists made uh, claims like, you know, masking never worked or vaccine actually made the situation worse. And there are many fact-checking, fact-checkers um, wrote stories about that and telling that, well, all the research papers quoted um, by these columnists uh, misinterpreted by the columnist. And another one was actually an interview with a medical doctor, a really well-known doctor in the UK. But if you look at the reputation of this particular doctor, you realize that this is the same expert who said COVID started in Europe like five, six, seven years ago. And he's still insisting on that. So you might want to think about telling the audience that so this expert said this, and this is his rationale. And this is what, I, what other experts who are disputing with this claim, and this is what their rationale. So I think, and we still don't know, we are still investigating. So I think that's the approach fact checkers should take. So in this kind of story, in my um, fact checking organization, Anilab, we have the label analysis. So instead of saying that this is misleading or false, we just say analysis. And then we tell what we know and what we don't know. Okay. All right. 
That's great. Um, I'm uh, I'll, I'm come, going to another question by PST Hannah. Uh, good morning, she says. It's good afternoon, of course. Now, uh, Hannah from Nigeria. They're having elections in their country that is believed to be highly rigged as data as at most polling units is not the same that is announced. How should mm. a professional journalist report such stories? I mean, it's difficult, but like I said, you know, now I think we should think about working with the public rather than for the public. And I remember the election land project in the US. So in the election land, what people did was news organizations got together and asked people to go to those polling stations and report what's going on to the journalists. So I think, I don't know if this is possible in your country or not, but if you could mobilize the public, let's say, you know, uh, whatever, Twitter users, Facebook users, Instagram users, and ask them, hey, you know, we are worried that, you know, some polling stations might be, you know, dealing with some dodgy <laughs> affairs. Can you go and take photos, take videos and report back to us? Let's monitor this election together. If you could mobilize them and work with them, it's much better than a small group of journalists trying to make, you know, observe the election. And you know, obviously professionals are doing it. United Nations often send, like, you know, uh, election monitoring observer teams, but they are still small. If you could mobilize the entire public, at least people who are concerned about the situation in your country, I think that might help as well. Got it. June, she asks, thank you for your insightful sharing. I wonder whether scientific related misinformation could be discerned somewhat more effectively and timely because it could be more likely to be verified in time. But for political or historical issues, the truth cannot appear timely. So, you know, how does fact checking help in this problem? Which is, I think, is a fantastic question because, yeah, that's, a, that's the problem with uh, history and politics, right? We just won't know in time. Well, in fact checking, we say, you know, opinions are not fact checkable, right? So, opinion about facts is not fact checkable. So, in politics and history, oftentimes what people are arguing is actually how to interpret the facts rather than the facts themselves. So if you're disputing the facts, let's say, for example, this massacre happened or not, and I think that's closer to scientific fact-checking, right? You have dead body counts, you have uh, eyewitnesses account. In case of you know Ukraine, Russia, you have like satellite images and whatnot. So there are pieces of evidence that you can employ to sort of discern what happened to a comfortable degree to say, yes, this really happened. The bridge was bombed. The question in history is that why was the bridge bombed? It was instigating the war or was it planned? Is was there conspiracy theory? You know, um, so that that's a part where, you know, fact checking is no longer relevant because that that that's a separate issue and that's a separate thing right so you can have a very great in-depth analytical piece but that's not necessarily fact checking i think yeah okay got it so kuram shahzad asks how is it possible to impose barriers on social media as anyone has a cell phone and can be a journalist uh, uh you know so essentially asking the question of how can anyone enforce barriers on social media? Uh, what should we do in the barriers meaning, you know, anyone since, so I'll read out the entire question. As anybody who has a cell phone or considers himself a journalist can kind of upload that information. Uh, they can make a video and upload it. So I think it's a basically going back to a, a very existential question. What should we do in this situation? Um, I think that um, so I see it this way. It's like football, you know, all, I mean, anybody can play football, but if you're going to be playing at the level of like, you know, national representation type teams or like World Cup, English Premier League, whatever. So I think journalism now is like that. Everybody can be journalist. But if you're a professional journalist, you have to show the others that what you can do that they cannot even imagine they could do, 
right? So I think, again, I think my, I'm going back to my previous slides. We have to step up the game. If you want to claim to be a professional journalist, even if many other people are engaged in journalistic work and activities, your work should be different. You should, your work should stand out. You know, what you say, the information you include, the process of verification you employ has to be something that wows the public. Otherwise, they're not going to follow you. They're not going to, you know, watch your content, I think. Got it. Okay. I think the questions are coming thick and fast, and I don't think we will have the time to answer every okay. one of those questions. <laughs> but um, I, we have a few more minutes. Uh, so, uh, you know, someone asks, a uh, question which is uh what why is media literacy only for journalists uh shouldn't it be for everyone no yeah uh, media literacy is for news audience i'm saying the opposite media literacy often targets the news audience but now i'm advocating for journalists to go through media liter literacy training as well yeah yeah so media literacy is definitely for everyone yeah okay so that's that's fantastic. Uh, Sujit asks how to overcome the psychological wall created by misinformation and disinformation. I find not many people are ready to welcome the truth because of the psychological wall. I, I think it's again, you know, our the theme of today's talk is to make the truth go viral. Um, so I think the attractiveness of your news report or content has to appeal to them to break down the wall, right? I think that's the only way we can do um, because we can't play the same game. Uh, you know, uh, the volume we cannot match, you know, uh, speed we cannot match. So we have to find something else to fight back. And then maybe one way to fight back is the quality. And if your quality is really good, which appeals to many people, they will then follow. I think it's a bit like Hollywood movies, you know, even if yeah, if bad, bad actors are like, you know, big budget Hollywood movies, we are probably thinking more like, you know, low budget, um, I don't know, uh, independent films that goes big, you know? So that kind of like strategy is something that we might be able to learn from. I mean, as far as content creation goes, I'm not an expert in that. And I think that's the reason why you have like five workshops talking about, you know, pro, uh, production skills. So, yeah. Got it. Okay. Two more, two, three more questions. I'll squeeze sure, sure, in. Sure. News that are highly technical, like medical news or astronomy. Uh -huh. right. A journalist cannot be an expert in every area. How can I debunk yep. such technical misinterpreted reporting from Gyaneshwar Tiwari? Well, I, I, I really think it's not that difficult. You just have to learn. Um, you know, there, there is a whole uh, group of science journalists who do brilliant job. And uh, I don't think they're technically, well, I, I think one, I forgot the name of the person, but there's um, this uh, science journalist from CNN and he applied for the job. And I don't know how true it is, but I heard uh, this story, it's anecdotal. But when he was interviewed, he had like no science background whatsoever. And so the producer asked, why should I hire you? Have, you have no knowledge of science at all. And you are applying for science reporter job. And he said, that's why you should hire me. I represent the audience. You know, audience knows nothing. I know nothing. If I report science, you know, I come from the audience point of view. So, you know, I can, and I think that's, again, my philosophy of working with the public, you have to learn with the public. So you can, you know, transparently say, I know nothing, but I'm a reporter, I'm going to find out, you know, come with me through this journey kind of news reporting. So in a way, when you discover facts, and you tell bits and pieces what you learned from that process to the audience that might work, I don't think it's that difficult. This is great, uh, good words of uh, encouragement. Anmol Alfonso asks, what do you think about pre-bunking? You know, what Cambridge uh, researchers at Cambridge did, pre-bunking misinformation, can it be effective in a dynamic information landscape? 
I, I, I think so. I mean, many research indicates that uh, prevanking helps, you know, uh, and there are a lot of research showing that, you know, first impression is very important when it comes to um, new information as well. So, and now if you look at uh, memory retention, you tend to remember the first encounter as well. So if the first encounter is pre-banking or anticipating what sort of things uh, might be coming and then you tell the truth, I think that's quite effective. Now to do pre-banking well, you really have to be a trained fact checker in my view, because you have to know the pattern. You have to anticipate what sort of things go viral. So for example, when you have a big earthquake in Turkey, many fact checkers around the world could already anticipate what kind of video is gonna show up, what kind of claims gonna go viral. So we they were ready at the time, right? They have a stock of like many old earthquake videos that surfaced again and again and again in the last five, six years. So we have a stock knowledge of that. So we could actually warn them, this earthquake happened, it's horrible. There are lots of news reports coming in, but if you are coming, uh, coming across user-generated content, it might be ABC, right? So that kind of pre-banking, I think, really helps. And then I think it's effective, yeah. yeah. We have so many, many excellent questions. Uh, I'll tell you what, I'll ask one last question to you. And for the others, we will continue to stay in this chat and then we will we'll knock them off one by one. We won't have Masato to answer them, but yeah, we'll try. So okay. Somitra uh, Banerjee- I think I actually have time, so I can stay if that okay. helps. Okay, so shall we, shall we do another 10 minutes then, uh, Masato? Okay, all right. Okay. So, okay. okay. Uh, Somitra Banerjee asks, uh, and I picked this because it's the theme of today's talk, always the misinformation goes viral, but when we place a true story, it does not attract audience. How can we combat this? I mean, going back to the theme of your talk. Yeah, but you know, I think that's a misconception about that idea as well. So probably many people refer to the research paper that came out from MIT. That was when researchers said, you know, uh, lies travel six times faster on Twitter than the facts. But at, in, if you read that research paper, again, going back to the source, that research actually compared misinformation and fact-checking stories that correct that misinformation. This group of researchers did not study whether or not truthful information about the same topic. Uh, now, okay, how? truthful information about that topic was distributed and disseminated. So to, to simplify things, let's say something big happens, right? In the US, CNN, uh, New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, whatever, everybody reports. And there's also misinformation about that news event. So there are lots of lies on social media. And there are fact-checking organizations that debunks those lies. In this MIT research, what they compared was the misinformation and the fact-checking story. And yes, misinformation has far wider reach and fact-checking didn't reach so, much, so many people. However, there was a whole slew of mainstream news media also talking about the same topic with fact-based information. That one was not part of the comparison. So if you bring that in, that was the earlier presentation that I made. Actually, we are going viral. Mainstream media is actually going viral. It's just that, you know, uh, people's perception seems to be uh, fixed on online activities nowadays and social media activities. But if you look at um, media consumption studies around the world, in still in most countries, the primary source of information is TV news. Um, so I'm not quite sure if it's accurate or it's, you know, we might be misunderstanding the situation if we think that, oh, misinformation is always winning and we are always losing. I don't think it's the situation we are in. Then, you know, of course, you know, it's sad to see fact-checking stories don't go viral all the time, but I think that game we can never win. I don't think we should compete that way. 
Great. Kritika Goel asks, in health fact-checking, there's always a fear that we might pass off an expert's opinion as a fact. While it's true that we can rely on peer-reviewed studies, uh, we are not always adept at understanding what the study says. How do we navigate that situation? Well, the, the approach I force my students to take is to interview the researcher. So if you don't understand anything from the research paper, contact that person and ask explanation. Or you can sort of email say, hey, I interpreted your paper in this way. Am I correct to say this to my audience? I always you know, uh, ask students to get the comment from the person who's involved in the research. So I think that's, uh, that's a must step. Uh, that's, that's a step that you have to go through if you're a journalist. Okay. Um, I'm just checking for questions that are, there are some questions that are very le relevant to just uh, some countries. So I'm, I'm skipping yeah. that for now. Um, okay. Sometimes, so uh, um, I'm sorry, I think it's a, I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name right, but Methmali Disanayake asks, sometimes public opinion is on the side of the fake news or disinformation. So how can we carry it in our reporting in such situations when the people also like that? I mean, that's a problem we see in many countries. Yeah, uh, I, I think that's that's part of the job, I think. Uh, when I started my fact-checking uh, news website with students in 2019, when Hong Kong was going through probably unprecedented historical, you know, um, political unrest and pro-democracy movement, I mean, protesters and the police were clashing every weekend, tear gas everywhere. Um, we did fact check many things that you know um, protesters didn't want to hear, and we did get lots of um, backlash. <laughs> but we kind of said, "Well, I'm sorry, but this is not true." Therefore, and it's our job is to find out what facts are. Uh, I, th I think that kind of things are inevitable. In the pol if you're living in a polarized society if you fact check left you be attacked by the right if you fact check right you're gonna be attacked by the left right so the only way many fact checking organizations i know are making a conscious effort to fact check everybody so if it's politics um check all the parties you know um different uh standpoints etc uh, etc et i think i think that that that's you know that's part of the job, right? Being a journalist, I think, yeah. Even if public is with the misinformation, you, that shouldn't discourage you. I mean, I know it's it's tough because it can it can be very nasty personal attack and harassment. So you have to be prepared for that. I think, yeah. Okay, uh, I have a perfect last question, but I'm going to uh, that just two questions. Uh, there's one about language. Uh, is the language uh, Velayuthan Chandrasekharan uh, asks, as a language press has more reach than the English press, is there uh, any separate media literacy strategy for the language press? What What is language press? So non-English uh, media, because we're all in countries where English is not necessarily the dominant yeah. language. Yes, uh, there's a quite a bit of a, yeah. Yes, uh, I mean, in our curriculum, we emphasize this. I think that's a really good point. Uh, many media literacy instructions written in English language world, or, you know, uh, popular language um, is not applicable to minor languages. So for example, Wikipedia. You know, in English language, you can say, okay, let's start with the Wikipedia. This is the topic. Here's the Wikipedia page. You look at the citations. They have like 25 footnotes. So let's click this and is this credible? So actually Wikipedia can be a good entry point for media literacy training with the students. In Vietnam, in Thailand, Wikipedia has very little entries in their own languages. So this strategy 
if teachers try to adopt, it doesn't work at all. So what you can do is, okay, here's the topic. It's very controversial, but if you look at Wikipedia, it's only one paragraph. How can we then make this one paragraph better to make like 10 paragraphs with footnotes and, you know, uh, links? So that's when educators come and say, okay, where can we find more information? Shall we go to the university library? Do they, you know, have encyclopedia? Or maybe do we, can we use this library database? Is there anybody in Thailand who's considered expert in this topic? What does he or she has to say about this? Can we email this person? Can we find out who this is, person is? So I think that if you start teaching media literacy or fact-checking, you realize that depending on the country, culture, um, language, it, the strategy can be very, very different. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm going to bundle the last uh, question. I'm going to be sneaky and ask you two questions and as a last question. Sure. One is uh, an if answer. You can send me the questions you know, as I a will. text, I, I want to take a look as well. And yeah, I will. I will. How about that? Uh, I'll ask yeah. uh, Divya to do that, uh, to copy and uh, send all those texts. Uh, so there's a question for which even I want the answer. Karen asks, in India, you have an instance of a very well-known fact-checking outlet whose founder ran an anonymous satire handle for a long time before being outed. Do you think okay. that satire could be a way to help make the truth go viral? Uh, that is one question. And then the last question uh, is, okay, you answer that and I'll ask you the last question. I, I, well, satire is very entertaining content if you know that it's satire, right? So to understand that it's a satire, you have to know what the news is what the facts are. So you know which part was made up, you know which part was political commentary and which part is real news, right? Without knowing that, satire can be very, very dangerous. Um, in 2014, when we had umbrella movement, I actually, in my online teaching class, I made writing satire as an assignment. And many students enjoyed it because they can make stuff up with satire, with a very you know politically biased uh, way, unlike the news reporting assignments that we ask them to write. And we had a student website. We posted the student satire stories that had 10,000 more views than the <laughs> regular news uh, stories that students publish and then we number one we realize the power of satire and entertainment yes if you make the content entertaining people will read even if it's a student newspaper website tens of thousand people will read the article in, in within hours number two having said that there's a huge danger to that because many audience don't realize that it's actually a satire so some of the reactions imply that they took it seriously <laughs> and they thought it's a real news. So I think satire requires, you have to be selective about the audience. Otherwise I think the negative side, you know, effect, I mean, I think it's very, very tricky to use satire for fact-checking. I, I would almost discourage, I think at this point, because, you know, in my experience, many people would mistake that, yeah. Right. Okay, and finally, finally, the last question. Yes, yes. I, th I think it's an appropriate question. Shanavaz Akhtar asks, I know we are living in a post-truth world, but do yeah. you feel the time will come when there will be not much need for fact-checking? Because there are certain governments under whom fake news has flourished in recent times, but if they depart, it may get reduced. Uh, can you repeat the last bit? Government because is doing if they what? depart, if the government that uh, spreads fake news, if it goes mm -hmm. away and is replaced by someone else, will so if that happens, do you see that there will come a time when there won't be much need for fact checking? I well, I mean, if you look at human history, I think the answer is kind of, I mean there will be, you know, I think it's almost human nature that we like gossiping. You know, we like rumors. 
you know, if you have a group of three people, we start arguing. And when argument heats up, you start making stuff up, you know. So I don't think we will ever see a world where there is no need for fact checking. If everybody knows how to fact check, which is the world I want to live in, it's much harder to lie because people then will point fingers at you. Oh, that's a lie. Well, I verified this. I want to live in that situation, but still, I think there are many, again, known unknowns are much bigger than known knowns. So there's always be unknowns around us. And I think there will be a need for fact-checking and fact-checkers um, forever, in my view. Yeah. Well, it keeps many of us in business, at least for a while. That is a very <laughs> Whether it's, it's a viable business or not is a completely different question of architecture. You know? yeah, that is true. I agree. I yeah. agree. Yeah. But um, thank you so much for that, uh, Dr. Masato. It's well, been. I, I hope I answered your questions okay. I kind of feel, you know. They're very tough yeah. questions. They're not easy yeah. questions. And there are 44 questions. So we've tackled 24 of them. Uh, okay. So we'll try and, um, I'll tell you what, we'll try and uh, put those questions together. Um, not, I mean, you won't find it as a recording, but somehow we will try and answer it um yeah if you could send them to me then you know we'll I, i'll think about what to do i you know yeah yeah, yeah i, I, I want to look at the questions and i'd like to answer as much as i can or if i don't know the answers maybe i can indicate who might know the answers to that questions so you know yeah. and, and i will say i mean i think our audience also understands we have a time con constraint and even if you are not able to answer the question i feel that the, the very fact that these questions you've asked all of you mm. is itself teaching us something. So we will take your questions and read them at least Definitely. at the very least uh, because it will help and, you know, it'll find its way back in some form. Yeah. That's what I yeah. believe. Uh, so thank you, Masato. And uh, thank you my so apologies to me. everyone whose questions we couldn't answer. Sorry. Sorry. You were saying something. Thank you oh, so no, much. No, no. I just wanted to thank you once again and uh, for the great questions from the audience as well. Thank you so much. Yes, yes. It's a highly engaged audience. Uh, you know, we have a record audience and it's from uh, from the United States, west, eastward, a lot of people from the African continent, from Middle East, then from South Asia, and then, of course, South Asia and Southeast Asia, a lot of people as well. So thank you so much, uh, all of you, for joining us. And thank you, Masato. We'll let you go now. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. And please forget, uh, don't forget people that we have five workshops coming up in the next uh, Thursday. So it's every Thursday of March. And uh, this is Masato's uh, talk was a keynote, but uh, the others are going to be more to geared towards learning certain skills or understanding certain frameworks. And, uh, you know, uh, while we take these questions and we'll try and answer them in some way. Let me also share my screen once again. Uh, and this is today, but coming up next is Shohini. That's just in 48 hours time. This is, please note the time difference. It's 11 a.m. IST. That would be uh, 1.30 in Singapore <clears throat> and many countries in Southeast Asia. So this is on tactics of distribution on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, but also looking at the larger uh, way of how social platforms have changed and how distribution on social platforms have ch has changed in the last 10 years. And uh, Shohini is an excellent person for that. Uh, please attend that. We also have mobile video for truth telling. So that's uh, by Manon and Sanshay. Uh, they're people who you might have encountered because they do a lot of training and they're fantastic. And so they'll be doing that session the next Thursday. And then we have uh, Amit Varma doing why podcasts are better at conveying the truth and how to get started. Uh, so there's there's that as well. And uh, he's, he's the leading podcaster in India. So that promises to be very exciting. Again, that's on a Thursday. And then there's design basics for journalists who want to spread the facts. I'm personally very excited about this because 
I believe that I will learn uh, from this on design as well, because uh, that is something we're all struggling with, right? Putting, making sure we get the right fonts and and it's not just fonts, but also balancing everything. So I'm looking forward to that from Rishad of Splice Media. And we have Alan Soon, who is going to wrap things up again on the last Thursday of March on, uh, you know, related to strategic communication, getting your overall strategy. So one is tactics and one is strategy. So he's going to be talking about strategy. Uh, so looking forward to that as well. Uh, what about any Q&A? Let's just quickly see if the Q&A... If there are questions we can answer, um, um, if specifically if they are uh, related to, uh, if there are easy questions. Um, fake news is one issue, fact manipulation, which is more difficult to verify is equally problematic. How do we go to that next level of analysis as quick tools may not work? That's asked by Shweta Singh and as fact checkers and media literacy people, I'll try to answer that. Uh, I think you're you're absolutely right, but uh, increasingly there are um, um, attempts to uh, debunk st stuff like this, which is not exactly easily debunkable or easily fact checkable through uh, the idea of a context check or a story check. That's something we at Boom we're working on. So you might find information on that on how to do that. Where I think this is still very much an evolving field and we are evolving techniques and tools to deal with that. So I hope that answers your question for the moment. Um, let's just see. Uh, there's a question on sources. What if a source is put in an awkward situation? What is your advice on that? That's from Bishwarajit, I think, from Imphal Free Press. So I think the source is, is paramount. Uh, we've got to make sure that we keep their uh, uh, comfort and privacy uh, topmost and don't compromise the source, don't push the source, usually you will find that information. You can cross a reference and get it from other perspectives, other sources as well. So, uh, you know, ensure that the source themselves is not traumatized. And of course, these are everything is contextual, right? So one answer cannot be the answer to everything. Uh, let's just see what else is there. Kara Ortega asks, is your point of view um, what do you think about disinformation that sticks with certain audiences? Um, what can we learn from that so that we can perhaps think about this in our journalistic reporting? I, I honestly am beginning to think, Kara, that a lot of uh, fact-checking has to be accompanied also by uh, looking at the narratives that come across with every piece of misinformation. So is there a way you can just talk about the narratives? I mean, that's just like a counter question to you back, but I mean, we're thinking aloud here, so I'm just leaving it at that for the moment. Um, and then there's another question about what does a journalist do if they are trolled uh, by many and the private information is made top public? I mean, this is terrible. Um, um, doxing is a is a is is terrible. There are legal remedies, uh, of course. I'm sure you're aware of them. You can Google them, but of course, legal remedies are not of any use when. Uh, you know, it's happening here and now. Uh, the, we find that one way of doing it is to um, gather as many people as possible, ask our friends and family, let them in, tell them what's going on, uh, and 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 use that support system. Unfortunately, we don't have a troll busting mechanism in place that is completely effective just yet. There have been attempts, I think, around the world. There was something called troll busters that ran for some time. But honestly, this is a this is a major problem, and I think newsrooms should do better at supporting people uh, dealing with trolling, especially journalists uh, who are working for those newsrooms, even freelancers who are working for those newsrooms. And it's it's up to the rest of us in the community, other journalists, to come to your help. I mean, it's not a perfect answer, but it's the answer that we have right now. Um, So I think we'll leave it at that because this uh, webinar is going to automatically switch off in about five minutes. And um, I think we'll leave it at that because we've taken all these questions and we will definitely see if we can answer them or these, as I said, these questions will be very useful. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I can still see there are a lot of people still in the webinar and we'll see you in 48 hours time.
looking forward to that. Looking forward to Shohini's session. Thank you very much.